Hello there, my fellow hedge wizards, and welcome back to another episode of Warhammer Fantasy Lore. For, like, almost two years now, we have been talking about the facets of the various races from this rich and interesting universe. And while I have done the occasional episode of non-faction stuff, like holidays or currency, there is another one of these universal aspects I didn't talk much about. That aspect, ladies and gentlemen, is magic. Now, there's a lot of aspects to magic in Warhammer Fantasy, but as far as today is concerned, I thought it would be interesting to get started on the colleges from the Empire. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, abracadabra, shall we? The Imperial Colleges of Magic are a very important and powerful Imperial institution which was given the task and responsibility for training all individuals capable of manipulating the winds of magic. Then they are to be used in the service of the state and military for the benefit of the entire empire. They are places of learning, but they are also political institutions. They have physical buildings and a collection of apprentices, magisters and various servants. A magister, if the title is unfamiliar, is a fully trained wizard who is also licensed to practice magic. The founding of the colleges started with one particular individual, the famous lore master Teclis of Ulthuan, one of the greatest magic users the world has ever known. With the authority and permission of Magnus, and the more grudging support of those subordinate to him, Teclis took part in an event of profound resonance and importance. Amnesty was to be offered to all the hedge wizards and petty magic users which existed in the Empire at the time, and to seek out as many of them as possible. Word was sent by galloping outriders to every part of the Empire they could reach, offering a full pardon and training to any and all who knew or suspected they had an affinity for magic. For some, they experienced strange dreams, compulsions to journey to Aldorf as if some mysterious force was compelling them. Once there, if they submitted themselves to Teclis's judgment and training, and agreed to fight in the coming war, they would not be harmed by any of the Empire's other powers or agents. They would be under the protection of Teclis and the protection of the great uniter, Magnus of Nuln, later to become known as Magnus the Pious. The Elven Mage's incredible skills and profound sensitivity to the movements of the Aether enabled them to sense even the smallest conjurations by the pettiest of human spellcasters for leagues around them. This also allowed them to find potential magic users all by themselves. Using their arcane knowledge, the Elves could traverse the lands of the Empire with supernatural speed and uncover many of the more primitive and misguided magic users who were forced to live in secrecy at the time. Yet there were others who made their way to Talabheim of their own accord, handing themselves over to Magnus's authority in desperate hope. With barely a pause, Teclis and his two companions eradicated any witches and warlocks corrupted beyond redemption. On the other hand, Teclis left alone the priests and clerics of the Empire cults, despite sensing a great aptitude for magic in many of them. The holy men and women of the Empire were adamant that they had no power, or a desire to manipulate magic, insisting that any miracles their prayers might bring came directly from the gods. It is said Loremasters Yertel and Finreir were amused by the claims, but Teclis merely nodded and allowed them to be. The priests he had approached could already work magic with faith and rituals without learning the arcane spellcraft that Teclis offered. The great archmage saw no reason to inject doubt into their hearts by pressing the point. Then, Teclis and his brothers began to instruct their human students in the ways of spellcraft, much to the horror and disapproval of the many Templar orders of the Empire, most notably the Witch Hunters. Indeed, many people and long-standing Imperial authorities were aghast that these men should be permitted to embrace the sorcerous arts. But Magnus, voice of Sigmar, great uniter of the Empire, and last hope against the Chaos Hordes, ordered that it should be so. Magnus at the time also had the backing of the Grand Theogonist and the Elector Counts, so the Witch Hunters were held at bay. 
So it was that the Empire's base magic users and those slightly more refined practitioners of secret and not too corrupted arts, which they had learned in distant lands, began studying the rudiments of the arcane lores Teclis and his fellows had to teach. Time was against them though, so Teclis, Finreir and Yertle taught relatively simple offensive magic. Stuff like fireballs, lightning bolts and ear splitting noises. But he also taught them spells of healing to cure the injured of the battlefield and other such skills that would be useful against the legions of the dark gods. Two among the lore master's protégés excelled beyond all others, and their names are remembered and honored to this very day. The hot-headed Friedrich von Tarnus, shamed commander of the Karaburg Greatswords, and also first patriarch of the future Bright College of Magic. And of course, the most powerful and educated of all the students of Teclis, a man simply known as Volans. Alongside their lore master mentors, these two played a vital role. They helped in defeating the armies of the Dark Gods and scoured the Empire from the Taint of Chaos. In many battles, the Elven Mages and their human protégés showed their willingness to spill their own blood in defense of the Empire, and all of them took grave wounds during that horrible war. Loremaster Yertle himself fell in battle, beheaded by some clawed fiend of chaos even as he incinerated it with fire from his hands. He was buried in Ostermark with the greatest honor. Following the Empire's victory, in the final battle of the Great War at the gates of Kislev, the power of Chaos gradually ebbed away. Demons began to melt back into the realm of Chaos, helped along by the vicious spells cast at them by Teclis and his human protégés. Once the darkness had withdrawn from the land once more, the city of Prague was leveled and rebuilt though even afterwards it remained a haunted city where the dead are said to rest uneasy in their graves. So it was that the new breed of Magisters was hailed as the saviors of the Empire, alongside Magnus himself. For his part, Magnus was made Emperor, and under him the provinces were united under one rule for the first time in centuries. If the Elector Counts of the time had any doubts about installing the dark-eyed noble to the throne of the Emperor, they had to keep their thoughts to themselves. The people of the Empire had chosen their leader, and they would not be denied. Change was everywhere, but none were really prepared for what was gonna happen next. Upon the ascension to the throne, Magnus asked Teclis and Finreir to help him create an institution, where Imperial citizens might be properly trained in the full secrets of magic and spellcraft. The new Emperor had witnessed firsthand the usefulness of controlled magic driving back the forces of chaos on the battlefield. He stated that the Empire could not allow itself to abandon an asset as valuable as magic, especially in the face of his uncertainty as to whether the forces of chaos were actually defeated or simply driven away for a time. At first, Finreir advised against this, claiming that the secrets of magic and spellcraft were not meant for humanity. Humans and elves had come to blows in the past, and would probably do so again. Teclis, however, took the longer view. He reasoned that the safety or doom of the old world lay in the hands of humans of the Empire, for their lands were the most populous and held the greatest kingdoms and mightiest armies on the continent. Even as grudging allies to the elves, the humans could prove an important safeguard in any future war against the Chaos Gods and their minions. In this age, the elves no longer had the power to win such a war alone. Even more importantly, Teclis told Finreir, if the humans were unable to resist the physical and spiritual predations of Chaos, they might also fall to the Dark Gods one day. And then what? Ulfuan and maybe the rest of the entire world would be done for. After a lot of debating on the matter, the wisdom of Teclis eventually prevailed. So he and Finreir founded the Eight Orders of Magic in Aldorf, per the request of Magnus. For the good of the Empire, Aldorf was chosen, as it was close enough to Magnus' seat of power in Nuln for him to keep an eye on the budding orders, but not so close that should they implode, they would not drag him down alongside them. In the summer of 2304 IC, that is, Imperial Calendar, Magnus announced that Aldorf would house the new Orders of Magic. 
rioting erupted on the streets, and people fled from the city when the High Elves worked their magic to alter the nature of Altdorf itself to accommodate the new buildings. Though people would eventually return, they found their city much as it always was, but at the same time very different. The magic used to alter the fabric of the city made it unmappable, and the Outdorfers were left to navigate its labyrinthine streets by relying on landmarks rather than a sense of direction. This once again led to rioting, but the martial law ensured that the population, though grudgingly, accepted this new order. Finally established, the new orders of magic began courting the guilds and their leaders. It seemed that the wizards were wasting no time in getting involved in the politics of the city. The Grand Prince, who distrusted these new developments, established a separate state of citizenry, the Magister, to curb their growing power, while complex trade laws, voting rights, and rules of land ownership served as a stopgap measure to control the wizards' alarming influence in the city. Over the next few years, the wizards and the nobility of the city jockeyed for control, engaging in a complex dance of negotiation and intrigue. Though with each decade, the orders carved just a little more power for themselves, and even now, it is fashionable among the city's elite to keep a wizard in their household. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the foundation and early history of the Colleges of Magic of the Empire for today. Arguably, the best and most successful attempt at creating an organized and legal practice for magic users throughout the lands of Sigmar. Of course, there is a lot more to be said, as in the future we're hopefully gonna talk about their training, their organization, and their different branches. Are the Colleges of Magic among your favorite magic-ish topics in Warhammer? If you have any thoughts or questions about them, write them down in the comments below. Was the episode informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you an awesome day. May Sigmar's blessings be upon you.